from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 52. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Well, by this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. Hey, this is a remote place, they said. And it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, well, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. Well, when they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of fish and bread. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Well, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. The gospel of Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Thank you, worship band, for leading us. Appreciate it. Didn't expect to stand here for the whole gospel reading, did you? No, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's how I just like bulk up time in my sermon. I just choose a whole bunch of scripture. So... Uh, if I haven't met you, let, let me introduce myself. My name's Lori Brenner. I'm the senior pastor here. Thank you for being in worship with us. I would love to meet you afterwards, as well as Chris Wood as well. Uh, we'll be out in the narthex. Um, I saw a article the other day that caught my attention. Uh, we've had a group of people here working on some strategic visioning for moving forward. Our elders have been meeting on this. We've been talking about this. And we've especially been looking at the transitions in life that all of us hit. We all hit places of transition. And it seems especially that for those like between like 12 and mid late 20s, there's a lot of transition points in there. They're tricky points, can be tricky transition points. So these days, anything written about any of that age range catches my attention. Well, there was an article that I came across, and it's about a study from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. The study's called On Edge, Understanding and Preventing Young Adults' Mental Health Challenges. So the basis for this study is during COVID, there was a great deal of focus on mental health for teens, but less focus for young adults. So the Harvard School of Education led this study. They surveyed young adults ages 18 to 25 and their parents, and they did this in December of 2022. Well, 36% of young adults who responded to the survey reported anxiety compared to 18% of teens, almost double. 29% uh, of young adults reported depression compared to 15% of teens. Again, almost double. I guess the first one wasn't just almost double, it was double. Someone wasn't a math major. 
But the lead author of this report, Richard uh, Weisborg, this is what he said. Young adulthood can be a time of great growth and possibility, but far too many young adults told us they feel on edge, lonely, directionless, and they worry about financial security. Many are achieving to achieve and find little meaning in either school or work. Close quote. Maybe some of you too, even if you're outside of the young adult years, you remember this, right? And when I say you remember this, I'm not saying to the young adults, so we've all done this and you'll be fine. What struck me is how high those numbers were. I thought that was pretty astounding. They said the top drivers for young adults' mental health challenges include a lack of meaning, purpose, and direction. 58% reported that in the last week they felt they had a lack of meaning or purpose in their life. That's a huge number, 58%. Financial worries and achievement pressures, more than half of the young adults uh, self-reported on this. There was a perception that the world is unraveling. Again, about half of the young adults surveyed reported a general sense of feeling like things are falling apart. And a relationships deficit. 44% of young adults reported a sense of not mattering to others. And then another 35% reported feeling profoundly lonely. Social and political issues, including gun violence and climate change, also come in there. The study uh, concluded by suggesting that what was important was to cultivate meaning, which is good, develop gratifying and durable relationships, also very good, and helping experience their lives, I liked this, as more than the sum of their achievements. All of us need that one, right? As our lives is more than the sum of achievements. Now, I was thinking about this study in light of the story that the Bible tells as well. We've been in this series looking at the reliable authority of the Bible for all of life. And so the Bible needs to hold some reliable authority in these areas of, of, of loneliness, of anxiety, of fear, of, this, of this, uh, this whole realm on what I call the fear spectrum, right? Everything from being anxious and annoyed on one end to being out and out terrified on the other end. And that's what these stories look at that we're looking at today. The story that the Bible tells is that the world was created to be a place of, of order and light, of purpose and capacity, of dignity, and of rest. But with sin came a usurping of God's control, of God's own creation. And there is a, the world is now a realm of more chaos, of more darkness, of this, this loss of a sense of meaning in life is what scripture talks about as a result of this usurping from falling into sin a sense of disconnection and loneliness, that this is the water that we, that we swim in, this is the air that we breathe in the world. And so the Bible tells the story of a need for someone to come in to reestablish what in the New Testament is called the kingdom of God. That simply means the reign or the rule of God. So that God's rule that restores order, that restores light, that restores purpose and capacity, that restores dignity and rest, that this becomes the rule of the day. Because for all of us, anxiety, annoyance, fear, and terror, this is just part of who we are because we're born in this world, right? Since God's cre good creation was created for you know, abundance and fruitfulness, but what we experience is the wilderness experience. We experience lack. We experience the land of limited resources. A fallen world has limited resources. And we all, it's, like, it's like hardwired in us to be anxious about resources and provision. It's not just the circumstances. Because if you look around, some of the people in the world who give the least amount of money to help other people are the wealthiest people. They've got the resources. We have the resources. It's not the external resources we're reacting to. It's this internal fear, and there's good reason for that fear. Because with sin came a usurping of the abundance of God's good creation into a place of limited resource. We have a fear of the wilderness. The wilderness is that place of limited resources. Also with sin came a usurping of God's good creation of peace and safety, a place for flourishing and rest. On the seventh day, God rested. And instead, you know, there's, we have to be vigilant. There are things that will hurt you. There are things to be scared of. 
There's a sense of, of, of resistance and, some, and fear of what can happen. It's innate, again, because of the rule and the reign of sin in the world. So this, in our story today, there's, the story takes place both in the wilderness, the lonely place, and also in the sea, which in Hebrew storytelling, the sea is a place of chaos. The sea is a place of disruption. The sea is the place in Hebrew storytelling where at any moment the winds could come up and you could be destroyed and, you, and there's no order to it. You notice the Jews don't tell a lot of sea stories. The Greeks love sea stories, right? So when you read Luke and Acts, there's some really cool shipwrecks and ship sailing and things like this. The Hebrews, the Jews, hated the sea. The sea was a place where you got swamped and drowned. Don't go in it. They were not a seafaring people. I'm kind of, in that respect, I am a total Hebrew. I do not like being on a boat. But some of you like boats, okay? Who's Greeks? Who are the Greeks in the world, in the room? There you go. You love boats. God bless you. I'm not your, you're not my people. But in that respect, in that sense, right? So you've got the wilderness that's a place of lack. You have the sea that's a place of uncertainty and threat. And then the question is, where does Jesus meet us in these places? How does the, where is Jesus' authority reliable in the places of wilderness and lack, in the places of uncertainty and uh, uh, chaos in the sea? We already know because Mark told us at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus is uh, the one who will save from sin. He's the anointed one. That means he has the authority to establish God's rule and reign on the earth. And he's a son of God which means he has the power to make that authority effective in the world. We already know this. We've seen stories of this happening and coming about. And I wanna fill you in just a little bit of the story between last week when we had the story of Jesus casting the legion of demons out of the, the gentleman in uh, Genesaret, and this week when we've got the wilderness and the, um, and the sea, okay? Because here's what happens in between. What happens in between is that Jesus takes the 12, 12 of his disciples, he had a lot of people following him, men, also women, women who cared for all of them, who, who out of their own money took care of the needs, but these 12, he took 12 of his disciples and he sent them out on mission, and that's why they're called apostles. You'll sometimes hear that term in the church, the 12 apostles. Apostles means they were sent as missionaries. So these 12 disciples are sent out in pairs as apostles, and they're told, you don't need to take food, with you or money with you, okay? You'll be provided for along the way, and they were. I'm sending you with my power and my authority to teach and then to affirm the authority of that teaching by expressing the power to heal and the power to cast out demons. That's what the power to heal and cast out demons was for, to show that Jesus the Messiah has authority and as the son of God, he has the power to do what that authority tells him he's allowed to do. So he sends the disciples and guess what? amazing. They go out in Jesus' name, they're teaching, they're healing, they're casting out demons. And what we hear in, uh, uh, at the beginning of our verse, beginning of our reading today, uh, chapter 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him about all that they had said and they had done. Well, here's the interesting thing. Here, if you pull out a Bible or pull out your device, and I should have had this ready al already, but if you go into um, Mark 6, Mark is so well written. Mark is, are these eyewitness accounts from the Apostle Peter given to a fellow named John Mark. He's got a great story. We'll do that some other day because, heck, there's a Super Bowl today we need to get to. And um, uh, uh, what happens is if you look at Mark 6, verse 13. Mark 6, verse 13. Pull it up on your uh, device or look it up in your Bible. Here's what we learn about the 12 going out. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them, right? Now skip to verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. That's real smooth, isn't it? That's good storytelling. You could go right from Mark 13, boom, right into... Uh, Mark 6.13 into Mark 6.30. Look at your Bibles. What's the story in between? Somebody tell me. It's the beheading of John the Baptist. Mark is so well assembled. The way Mark has put this together is he takes the eyewitness accounts of Peter and he says, listen, there's things that Peter experienced anew following Jesus, which for you to experience and know them in this story, we're going to tell this story a certain way. 
And what Mark consistently does is has these little interruptions. And this is one of the most stark. Because in between this amazing experience of being able to go out successfully in the power and the authority of Jesus to teach, heal, and cast out demons, the greatest prophet in the kingdom of heaven is beheaded by King Herod. In between this amazing experience of going out in Jesus' name, which one would think would just keep taking you forward to Jerusalem and putting Jesus on a throne, the voice in the wilderness who announced Jesus is killed by a desperate ruler in the middle of a feast because he liked the way some young girl looked dancing. It's a horrible story. And by putting it here, what Mark lets us know, what he reminds us is, is gonna be going on here, is that what is coming up is going to be resistance to Jesus. It's going to be resistance to Jesus. We see this now also with the disciples when they come into this. When they come into this part, they've just come back from all this excitement and now they're gonna have two experiences where all this power and all this authority to teach for them isn't enough. It's not enough in the wilderness and it's not enough on the sea. This is gonna be their experience. And the very last line of the story, did you catch it? They didn't understand it was Jesus walking on the sea because they didn't understand about the loaves, because why? Their hearts were hardened. So here's my question. I read that this week and I went in my prayers, oh Lord, if these men who walked with you, who knew the sound of your voice, who knew what your eyes looked like when you were talking, who saw you do these deeds of power, who heard you teach it, who had just distributed all that food to all those people, if they didn't get it, because their hearts were hardened, what hope have I got? Where is my hope when I'm in a wilderness place of turning to you and receiving from you? Where is my hope when I'm in a stormy place of recognizing you and not being afraid? This is my question coming to the story today. And it seems to me Mark has shaped this story in the way he has to help us answer that question. It's almost like Peter is saying, we didn't see it, we didn't get it, we want you to see it, we want you to get it, so listen to this story. They're exhausted, Jesus knows they're exhausted. He says, come with me for rest. This is an aspect of the kingdom of God, is rest. Invites him away. Now imagine you're supposed to go for rest, you pull up in the boat, these crowds have recognized not only Jesus, but you because you've been going around teaching and you've been going around healing and you've been going around casting out demons. And so they're excited to see them, not just Jesus, did you notice that? Them. You're exhausted, the boat pulls up and there they all are. What's your first reaction? You might be better people than me. <laughs> My first reaction is not good, right? What was Jesus' first reaction? What does it tell you in that verses? Do you see it? If you look back down in verse 34, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. Now I know why I was so confused. My pages were completely out of order, but we're still in the same story. Jesus has compassion, right? Jesus has compassion. He's teaching them. I love how snarky the disciples are then at the end of the day, right? This is not a, um, this isn't a very respectful way to approach Jesus. This is a, will you please get rid of them now? It's been a long enough day everybody's hungry, you, need to, you, you, you just need to tell them to go, right? And then Jesus, of course, looks at them and says, well, why don't you just feed them? And you've heard the size of the crowd was 5,000 men. This is, this, was, this is just the way they counted back then, right? You counted the guys and then you like factored in how many women and children there would be. That's about the size of both Capernaum and Bethsaida put together. So this is a massive crowd. This is like two surrounding towns emptied out there into this deserted place right? And Jesus looks at them, and what does Jesus say to the disciples? You feed them, right? Now remember, he had just sent them out to teach and to heal and to have power and have authority. He intentionally pulls them up to the very edge of their own capacity. He had given them his capacity, and now out in the wilderness place, they are at the end of their capacity. And they basically say to him, we would need a half a year's wages to do anything about this. This is so unrealistic. 
And then Jesus says to them, well, what have you got? Tell me what you have. Notice how he gets them to focus on what they have, not what they lack. We'll come back to that. He draws their attention to what they have, not what they lack. And then you heard how the story went. He looked up to heaven. He gave thanks. He blessed the bread. He broke it. He distributed it. Everybody's fed. Everybody has enough. And then it says that Jesus immediately sent the disciples out. In another gospel, in John's gospel, we're told about the same event. What John highlights is the fact that at that point, everyone who'd just been fed was so excited about Jesus, they were ready to make him king then and there. And he wanted to avoid this, right? Mark doesn't seem to focus on that so much. Mark doesn't give the reflection back on why Jesus did it. Mark is much more eyewitness. Mark is much more Peter saying, and then for some reason, he sticks us in a boat, right? And then he goes up on a mountain to pray, and we're out on a boat in the middle of the sea, and the wind is against us. Now, mind you, he's been in the boat with them before in a storm and calmed the sea, so he know, they know he can do this, but he's not there. The wind is against them. They're straining, they're straining, they're straining, and in the middle of the night, about 3 a.m., just before the dawn, they see some specter walking by, and it freaks the daylights out of them, and they all cry out, and the next thing you know, what do you know? It's Jesus. And he says to them, what does he say? Take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Take courage, it's I, do not be afraid. It's, it's such a good eyewitness testimony. It's interesting because in, in uh, Job, in the, in the book of Job, there's one time where the, where the author in the book of Job, Job says this in Job chapter, chapter nine. Let me find it. He walks upon the waves of the sea. If he goes by me, I will not see him. And if he passes by me, I will not recognize him. Here's, here's, this, here's the story here. What we have in this story is these disciples recognizing that to follow Jesus is not one victory after another of teaching and healing and casting out demons all the way to Jerusalem. What they're going to learn is that following Jesus does put them in the middle of wilderness sometimes and places where their own capacity is not enough for what they're facing. That following Jesus will send them into storming places and chaotic places where they can strain and strain and strain and make no headway. And it's easy when we're in those kind of situations to feel terrified and scared and angry and abandoned. And this story is here to remind us that in the midst of limited resources and threats to life, the authority of power of Jesus can inhabit the same wilderness space of scarcity and the same seascape of threat. Let me say that again. We naturally would assume that if Jesus is powerfully present with us, that his reign and his rule is going to mean that there is no lack and there is no threat. And that is what his reign and rule will mean at the end when Jesus establishes his kingdom. But what the disciples had to learn in this story was that Jesus' power and authority with them can inhabit the exact same wilderness space of scarcity and sea space of threat, that those things can be together. And there's a particular way that Jesus interacts with them in those spaces. And this is our lesson for this, too. Think about the wilderness spaces that you're in. When I was in my uh, early 20s, I was profoundly lonely. And I figured it was because I was single. Um, and then I found out from some older adults who were my mentors, they're like, oh no, wait till you're lonely in marriage. It's a lot worse. Um, so that didn't give a lot of hope. Um, <laughs> but one of them gave me a book called Journeying Through the Wilderness of Loneliness. I had never thought about loneliness as a wilderness. There are, there are ways that lack of resource, that lack of capacity come up in our life that aren't just money. It is money, and it is physical resources, but a lack of, the, of, of meaningful relationships can be a wilderness. A, um, uh, other, other, you know, a lack of purpose and a sense of purpose can be a kind of wilderness. There are many ways that this, this fear or this lack, I wonder for you this week, where did you feel anxiety because you weren't sure there was going to be enough or you weren't sure that you were enough? That's a wilderness space. 
And then there are stormy seascape kind of spaces, spaces where there's a fear that something could come up any moment and swamp you. Spaces where you need to stay vigilant because people you love and things that you love are under threat. Spaces where um, you are straining and straining and straining and you're not making headway. Where have those spaces been for you this week? These are the very spaces that Jesus meets us with his authority and his power as the Son of God. And there's just, there's, there's just three things that struck me this week sitting in this, because personally, this hasn't been a wilderness week for me, but as many of you know, I have, my father's been sick and we're, trying to, we're walking alongside him to try to get him to health, and, uh, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting, and, 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 it, and it's, there's not enough resource. There's not enough capacity, right? Each of us hit things where there's not enough resource, there's not enough capacity. And let me tell you the good news. Jesus brings resource and capacity. Jesus brings resource and capacity. And there's things that were such a gift to me in this story. Here's the first thing that's, a, that's such a gift in this story. If you're in a situation of scarcity or resistance, that's not a sign that you're in the wrong place. If you're in a situation of scarcity or resistance, that doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. There are weeks where what I constantly pray to the Lord is, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then a voice comes in that says, did I hear Jesus wrong? Was I not supposed to be here? Was I not supposed to take that job? Was I not supposed to be at this point in my life? Was I not supposed to do this? We'll turn back on ourselves in these places. But situations of scarcity or resistance, it doesn't mean that you're not in exactly the place that Jesus wants you. Because the disciples were in a situation of scarcity and a situation of resistance, and it was exactly where Jesus had taken them. But we're afraid, we get scared and anxious that we will be abandoned or there won't be enough, that there won't be enough or we will be abandoned. So the first move I think that hardens our hearts is if in that situation of lack or scarcity, we pull back on our own resources, right? It's like the disciples. Jesus saying, you go ahead and feed them. And the disciples immediately said, we don't have enough. And they're right, they didn't, right? We don't have enough. We pull back on our own resources. In a scary situation, we see, they, they see that specter, that something on the water, and they're immediately just terrified. It never even crosses their mind that it's gonna be Jesus, right, that Jesus could be present with them in this. They're just immediately terrified. And you pull back on your own strength and your own resources. The first thing that hardens hearts is in a very real situation of lack or of, of threat, pulling back on yourself. That's the first hardening the heart move. So what do we do instead? Well, look at Jesus' example. I love Jesus in these stories, because well, I love Jesus in all of his stories, but what I especially love in this one is I love how even Jesus looks to heaven before he sends that bread and that fish out. Any Jewish man, any Jewish rabbi is going to thank God, bless the bread, break it, and, and, and serve it. But he looks to heaven to do it. Jesus heads up to pray and be watchful. If even Jesus, the Son of God, the authority of the Messiah, looks to heaven, withdraws to pray, how much more is that our first move in situations of lack or threat? The first move in keeping our hearts open is to not fall back on ourselves. The second is to learn from Jesus, to look to heaven, to have prayer and watchfulness. That's the second move. And then the third move that I think we learn from these stories is in terms of responding with open hearts is to listen to what Jesus said to his disciples. First thing he said to him is what do you have? What do you have? The Bible says this all the time. God will provide for you what you need in the moment in the situation you are in. What do you have? where they said, we don't have enough and we're not enough. Jesus said, well, what have you got? Give me what you got. And they gave what they had. Five little loaves and two fish, right? Bring what you have to Jesus. Of course you don't have enough. And of course you're not enough. But you are loved with who you are and what you have, Jesus can make enough of it. Quit comparing yourself to other people. Quit taking up inventory of what you lack and where you fall short, and where you are not enough, and let Jesus ask you, what have you got? And give it to him. That's, that's, that's step one. And then also, 
Recognize Jesus' presence. Take heart and take courage. Reading scripture is a perfect way to recognize Jesus' presence. Uh, uh, coming into worship and prayer, perfect way to recognize Jesus' presence. Being in community with others, good way to recognize Jesus' presence. But to, re- to look for Jesus, to look for Jesus. To receive his grace and to recognize his presence. Because here's what you need to know about Jesus. His response, when you are harried and you are far from home and you are hungry, his response to you, it's compassion. You saw it in the story. Jesus is looking at you with love. In all the places where you're afraid, in all the places where you're anxious, in all the places where you know that you're not enough, Jesus looks at you and he loves you. He's looking at you with compassion and with love. Not to demand from you, but to give you a chance to learn grace. And here's the second thing to know about Jesus is his response when you are under threat, when you are straining, when you're making no headway, is to approach you and approach you fast. He's not keeping his distance. He's not standing on the shore just to kind of see how you get along. He's coming for you. He's coming for you in love and in grace to help you. Let's pray.